Welcome, everyone, and special welcome to our Sangha family in Malaysia. Um, I met many of our Malaysian Sangha back in uh, 2004 when we did some A Whole World is a Single Flower trip, and we went to the temple in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, you all were great hosts to us. And then I also met some of you at the Whole World's Single Flower Conference in Korea back in 2013. And um, the topic of the talk, as you all know, is Zen Master Sung San, his impact on me, on the community, and also special teaching that comes through Zen Master Sung San. And of course, most of you know this, but Zen Master Sung San is the founding teacher of our school, the Quantum School of Zen. So um, I met Zen Master Sung San in 1979, and I had been practicing Zen for mm, about four years, and I had for two or three of those years, I had lived in a rural Zen community. And I had started meditating uh, some number of years before that. So my experience with practice had been a little bit more in the Soto Zen tradition. Um, and I had sat, this is very important to the story, I had sat two seven day retreats with a Japanese Zen master named Soen Roshi. Soen Roshi was a very important Roshi in Zen in America because a couple of the teachers that he made Zen masters were very influential teachers in the West. Edo Roshi in New York was one. And another Roshi who I met years later named Kudo Roshi, who was another uh, person that Soen Roshi had given transmission to. And probably what's important in this story is in that time in 1979, I had um, probably through my meditation practice before, and also just the cultural things that had been happening in the United States during the time that I was growing up, I was on a journey looking for reality. I grew up in a suburban community and I was left feeling that the people around me and the lifestyles around me were marked with what I thought of as inauthenticity. I remember being 15 years old and being at a big party and saying to people, I just want to know who I really am. Now that's a teenager's question, but to be quite honest, that question still powers my practice. And that what I've learned over time is better than getting an answer is cultivating the question. And just as an aside, that's one definite thing that I've learned from Zen Master Sung San, that the questions are more important than the answers. Generally, when we come to an answer to a question, we just find something that calms us because really we're looking for calm and security. But calm and security are not necessarily the friends of a Zen practitioner because really we're practicing to wake up to the moment and we have to cut through so much of our own fantasies, desires, and dreams to do that. So one of the things that I did learn from Zen Master Sung San is the power of great doubt. In the quantum school of Zen, not knowing what am I, what is this, is the foundational practice. And again, we're not looking so much for an answer. Oh, I am this or I am that. It's the recognition of the unfolding process of life. We don't live as objects, we live as process. And one thing we learned being around Zen Master Sung San is expect the unexpected. So back at that time, I was at a particularly low point in my, in my life. I was very sad about relationships and 
a little bit unclear of what I was I should do with my life or with my practice going forward. And I think one thing that really marks a Zen practitioner is that when you're struggling and in doubt, rather than again searching for answers, we turn back inward and ask that great question, what am I? So literally, I was frantic one day and driving in my truck, not knowing, I thinking I was going one place, but I didn't really want to go there and I was really lost. And in that moment, I remembered somebody from Empty Gate Zen Center had come visited, had come to visit our uh, small temple in rural California, and they left a flyer. And on the flyer, it was advertising a seven day retreat. In those days, we called them Young Mang Jong Jin, to leap like a tiger while sitting. And in that frantic moment, I remembered, oh, there's this seven day meditation retreat happening in Berkeley, California, which was about four hours away from where I was living. And I just didn't know what else to do. So I turned my truck around. I went back to where I was living. I called Empty Gate Zen Center and asked if there was space in the retreat. And there happened to be space in the retreat. It started the next day. I gathered a few things. I hopped back in my truck and I drove the four hours to Berkeley where I don't think I had ever been before. And I started sitting a seven day retreat. And again, that in and of itself to me showed something about my practice. When in doubt, sit. When you don't know, turn inward. When you feel lost, don't expect to find the answer outside. Turn your attention back in and just sit with it. So the way the retreat was structured, Zen Master Sung San didn't come for a few days. So many of you have sat our, our Quantum Young Min Jun Jin style, and that's what we did from early in the morning till 930 at night, sitting, walking, sitting, walking, chanting, bowing, raising great doubt, what am I? So on the third night, Zen Master Sung San showed up. And I can't really tell you too much about what his Dharma speeches were at that retreat. But what I was taken with was his presence. What, as I would say now, his aliveness, his ability to be right there what felt like at the origin of the moment. And seeing that lived by someone who was a practitioner, of course, called a Zen master, it resonated so deeply with what I was looking for, a kind of life that was genuine, and that was based in the moment, not based so much on my idea of things, but based on the experiential moment of being alive. And I was just taken with that expression of Dharma that was alive and lived, not just theoretical and taught. And I was taken enough by that that I moved into the Zen Center at the end of the retreat. I could almost say I never went back to where I was living, although, of course, I went back to gather my things and say goodbye to my friends there. But this, from this low point in my life, something opened, some possibility that it made sense to, to practice in a way that cultivated a kind of aliveness and a kind of freshness in life. I suppose I didn't say it, but, and I, and I know a lot of this is hubris of a teenager, but I would look around at 
especially the men who are like my father's peers and, and probably honestly, including my father. And everybody looked like they were acting, that they, there something essential about them was hidden. And they seemed fake to me, almost a kind of affectation that denied their reality and showed a face that wasn't really who they were. Now, whether I was right or wrong about that, I'll probably never know. I mean, I know my experience with my father, but it sent me on a journey to find out, to find a life that was real, authentic and alive. And if you listen, it's not a good life. It's not even a happy life. Although goodness and happiness are important for us, but it was a life that was vivid and real. That's what I was after. And meeting Zen master Sung San, along with, I have to say, So and Roshi, who I had sat with, I saw that it was possible. It wasn't just a theory that I had, but I could be with someone who actually showed that. And that has kept me on my journey all this time. So one thing about Zen Master Sung San, and this is a quote, Zen Master De, uh, De Kuang actually is the one who said this to me, but he said, when you're with Zen Master Sung San, every day is a big day. There's no time off. Going to lunch with Zen Master Sung San was deep practice, because in my experience, being with him, everything was a little bit surrealistic. You never knew what was going to happen next. You didn't know who was going to show up for lunch. He was, he had this infectious laugh. Everything was humorous to him. And I suppose my humor is based a little bit in irony and for better or worse, somewhat sarcastic. And I could feel that in him, his humor, his laugh, his ability to see the absurdity in life was really a breath of fresh air for me. So experientially, just being with him was a feeling of what it could be like to be awake, alive. And really, especially at that time, although I have to say it's still with me, for me, practice is a radical act. Practice is a, has the possibility of changing the world, not only changing myself, but changing the structures and the underlying dysfunction that human beings live with. It literally, for me, practice is about a revolution of humanity. And getting to be as old as I am, there's some disappointment and some tempering by realism about the power of the human condition. But it's probably still quite important to me to have that sense of possibility that we humans aren't destined to live a life of despair and disconnection from some vital energy. So I want to turn a little bit to a, a poem of Zen Master Sung San's, because I think this poem really, in, really encapsulates his teaching with one addition that I'll get to at the very end. And this poem is, is published in our book, The Whole World's a Single Flower. It's our Kung An book, and it's somewhat of a record of, uh, of the teaching. So, for those of you who want to look later on and you have the book, it's number 177 in the book. So it's called, many of you have heard it before, some have not. So it's called Original Face and it's a poem by Zen Master Sung San. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Only without thinking can you return to your true self? The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming, going. 
Let me read it one more time. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Only without thinking can you return to your true self. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming, going. So let's start with the first line. Your true self is always shining and free. So again, as I've been saying, that's not a concept. That's an unfolding reality. And for me, being with Zen Master Sung San, not necessarily in the structured environment of the Dharma room, although his Dharma talks, he was so funny and so alive in his Dharma talks that he would, tr he would attract over 100 people every time he came to give a talk in Berkeley. The irony, of course, was the next morning, the same 25 people were in the Dharma room, maybe with an addition of one or two. But it's a very attractive and appealing thing for us as people to be around someone so alive, so vital, and so vibrant. And each one of us, in our own particular way, not to be like Sansanim or Zen Master Sung San, but if we can truly embody our own nature, then we're already, we're already shining and free. Your true self is always shining and free. That's the beginning point. And that is Zen Master Sung San's teaching, and that is or was his embodiment. We're already complete. The Buddha already taught us. We all already have it. We just don't realize it. And the sixth patriarch said, the only difference between an enlightened person and an unenlightened person is that the enlightened person realizes it. So in that context, and we can say enlightenment is not something that we get. It's something we realize that we already are. But whether we realize it or not, we already are it. And to treat ourselves, others, and this world as already Buddha already changes the world. So if we can meet the world with a sense of we're meeting Buddha, or we're meeting our own true nature, it changes the way we behave. It changes everything. So if you take one radical thing from this talk, if you can live your life as if everything and every person you're meeting is the Buddha itself, imagine how that changes your behavior. And Zen Master Sung San had that capacity to treat the world that way. And when you're treated that way, that opens something in your own heart. So if you can give one thing to this world, it's to treat the world and everything in it as Buddha itself. So the poem goes on, human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. This is a very important point because it points to the fact that we make our own suffering. It's not saying we make our own pain, although we do make much, many parts of our pain. But of course, in the interaction with the world, life is difficult. Everyday life is a challenge. And even for an advanced practitioner, life is still challenging. It's a mistake to think we're going to practice, we're going to get something, and then everything's going to be better. We practice to be able to meet the moment we're living in, and we use our practice to help us see how we make our own suffering. In Zen Master Sung San's terminology, suffering is defined as holding, wanting, attaching, 
and checking. Holding, wanting, attaching. All the different ways we try to shape the world to make it fit some fantasy we have of that world. We hold on to what, we're, what we want and we are afraid we're going to lose. We push away things that we don't want. We mold ourselves to get praise and to avoid blame. All of those behaviors come from our desire to not suffer. So in our practice, we watch, we, we breathe in, what am I? We breathe out, don't know. And we pay attention to our entire experience. And we train ourselves to be aware of what's happening in the moment. And by doing that, we learn, oh, this is the way I create my suffering. Usually, I point the finger outward. It's your fault. If you would stop doing it, I would be happy. But the sixth patriarch taught us, take that finger that points outward, turn it back, and go inside. What am I? What is this? It's very difficult to control anybody's behavior, including our own but we have more of a possibility of changing something in ourselves than we do in expecting somebody else to make the change that we think they should make. Because we really don't know. The fundamental truth of not knowing becomes clear if we pay attention and if we're working with our center to breathe deeply in, breathe deeply out, bring our energy down and find some stability in our own experience. Very important point. And again, Zen Master Sung San embodied this. So we investigate, how do we make our own suffering? That's a Kung on question. Grab it. It says in the temple rules, grab the word head, the Kung on, and don't let go. Kungans, we often think, are about getting the right answer. More important than the right answer is raising great doubt. What am I? What is this? That's the meaning of human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Then he says, only without thinking can you return to your true self. In the third line of a four-line Zen poem, Basically, that's the Chinese shout, ha! Or sometimes you, you know when you're in a Kung on interview, you hit. That points to before thinking. Any idea that you have is just an idea. Put down all your opinion, your condition, and your situation. Then in this moment, perceive truth. What is it? So Zen Master Sung San was always shouting. He was always hitting. He was always encouraging us, put it down. Drop what you believe and think. Open your eyes, open your heart, open your body. Experience the moment and learn from this moment. That's the meaning of ha! And then the fourth line, the high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming and going. Truth is just like this. If we can get out from behind the fantasy of our illusions, we're more able to see clearly, hear clearly, taste clearly, touch clearly, feel clearly, respond clearly, and yes, even think clearly. Then we let go. There is no I, there is no you, there is no good, there is no bad. All of that 
is just a way of trying to organize the world. That's our conceptual framework. First, there's the experience. Then there's what we think about it. So this point leads us to truth. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming and going. That's the truth of the relationship between the mountain and the cloud. To me, all of that encapsulates Zen Master Sung San's teaching with one important addition. And that's what I want to end this talk with. Zen Master Sung San's tagline was only go straight, don't know. Try, try, try for 10,000 years nonstop. Soon get enlightenment and help save all sentient beings from suffering. In the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism, in Zen very definitely, and in our quantum school practice definitively, practice isn't some theoretical thing to think about, and it's not even something to only practice in the meditation hall. We take our practice and we go into the world and we work with the situations of our life guided by the bodhisattva vow of how may I help this world. Each moment that we're living is a Dharma gate. Each moment is a, is a moment to awaken and each moment is a, way, is a moment to be of service. It's not about being good rather than bad. It's about organically and at the origin point of the moment to come alive and respond from, you can almost say, respond as your true self what you truly are. It's not a concept. It's not an object. It's an unfolding process. Each moment allows us to become alive. We think we're born when we come out of our mother's womb and we die right before they put us in the ground or in the oven. But in between is a series of unfolding folding moments. And in each one of these moments, we become alive. And if we can meet each moment with this liveliness and energy, and be guided by the Bodhisattva principle of how may I help this situation? In my language, it's how can I interact in this moment where when the moment ends, everyone and everything is enriched. Rather than what can I get from this moment and what can I take from you, it's a real recognition that you and I are one, two faces of the same thing. And with that recognition, can I interact with you and the world in a way that everyone and everything is enriched. Rather than I'm going to be richer, but you're going to be poorer. In whatever transaction there is, we all benefit. This world is a very sad place, really. And we're in a time of history that's very challenging. Here in the United States, we're going through a very, at least this is my subjective opinion, I'll own that, but we're going through a very difficult time. There's a lot of yelling and screaming for my rights, what I want, but there's a lot of losing sight of how am I impacting the world? How can I make this a better moment? And Zen Master Sung San's life was predicated on that. How does he lived his life to make the world a better place, whether it was in his trying for the reunification of Korea, 
or just helping us find a better way to interact in our own world. He didn't give up. He died trying. And that is the model that we have for how to live our own lives and how to turn our practice, not just for me, but for the benefit of all beings. I'll end with one of his other lines where he would say, for me, suffering appears. For all beings, no suffering. The more we self-centeredly try to get for ourselves, it's counterproductive and we actually end up with more suffering. Maybe we get that thing we want, but immediately we start to hold and hoard. But if our attitude is for all beings, it's much more peaceful and there's much more freedom in our lives. All of this is easy to say, hard to get, but that's our life, that's our practice. Our practice isn't an object that gets defined. It's an ongoing process that we live. So I hope for all of us, we can remember Zen Master Sung San's teaching of our true self is always shining and free to really own the truth of the fact that in many ways we make our own suffering and that there is a way out if we can really grab that kung on, what am I, what is this? It has the potential to wake us up to the truth of this moment and help us embody the bodhisattva path of how do I bring peace, love, some harmony and compassion and wisdom into the world which I find myself in. So those of you who are in Malaysia right now, you're on a two day meditation retreat. Take this opportunity to try, try, try. 10,000 years is one moment. Each moment, wake up. Each moment, dedicate yourself to the benefit of yourself and all sentient beings. And I suppose when I include myself and yourself, keep great doubt and remember that we don't know who we are and that when we think we know who we are, we've lost our way. When we know we don't know, our mind is open and curious. We live with wonder, curiosity and awe and we can find our way. So thank you all very much for listening.